The following program is a production of Tim Jackson, who assumes full responsibility for its content. The content of this program does not represent the views of FCTV, which serves as a forum for community expression and offers TV training, production facilities, and channel time to all Falmouth residents and organizations. Good evening and welcome once again to West Falmouth History and Heritage. Tonight's episode, a founding family of the Swifts. This program has been made possible in large part by the hard work of the West Falmouth Library staff, including research librarian Rene Voorhees. So without any further ado, here's Rene. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming. It's a hot, muggy night. It's pretty hard to get out of the house on a night like tonight. And I will let you know that our air conditioning is not working quite right. I do have fans to set up after the slide presentation. And it should be cooled off by the time you get back here from the Quaker meeting house. So this is our schedule for tonight. Can everyone see? Am I in anybody's way? Can I shrink down? <laughs> Even lower, I can shrink down. There is some water over on the table here. Feel free anytime during the presentation to get up and get yourself a glass of water. All right, the slide presentation will take about 40 minutes. Um, the slides tonight are information heavy. Um, and there's two reasons for that. When we're talking about families, especially founding families of a community, um, the best source for getting to um, capture that family and what they stood for and their effect on others in the village is to take a look at primary resources. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you tonight it are, comes from either our archives here or the Falmouth Historical Society, their archives, or it comes from pages of the Falmouth Enterprise that was, they were indexed, photographed, beginning in 1896 and up through about 1940. So as we meet the individuals tonight, I am relying on obituaries. That sounds a little morbid, but in the obituary, they do the greatest job of capturing the character of each of these individuals. The Swift family is massive. There are Swifts all over the Cape, Cape, and I dare say, probably all over the United States. Tonight we have some descendants here from Alaska, Maryland, I'm not sure about Hawaii, uh, okay. Um, but if you are a Swift descendant of any Swift family, doesn't have to be West Spelman. Please, and I don't care how many generations back that was, please put your hand up if you are a Swift descendant. All right, well, welcome. I hope you learned something new tonight. I hope I learned from this presentation too. The last time we did this, I had to go back and revise the presentation before I posted it because there was so, so much information that came to me that evening. I should introduce myself. I am Renee Voorhees. I am a part-time archivist here and an assistant circulation clerk. I wrote a grant two years ago um, because I only lived here 10 years, but in the 10 years, there is so much history here that is distinct, that is different that should be shared, not under the umbrella of Falmouth or the umbrella of Cape Cod, but with residents, summer residents, full-time residents, visitors, um, because you don't often come up with a history that is as rich as the history in this village. So before we begin, I had, I had much help when it came to pulling this together. And so you'll see who I'm thanking here. And if I can have a few people sitting in the audience just raise their hands. So I mentioned Susan Myers. 
okay, who spent hours at the Falmouth Historical Society getting information for me. Um, Erica Adams in the back. Erica is doing our oral history um, uh, endeavor. And so what we're doing is we're meeting with um, the older residents of the village and asking them to share memories about growing up here, stories that they heard uh, growing up, um, any stories about parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that they might recall. So Erica is leading that effort. And then David Young is also here. All right, he's in the back. David is a member of the Quaker Meeting House across the street. He has organized the tour for you. On the back table, there is a printout of all of the Swift uh, memorials in the library with a map to guide you. And there are, I think, 162 in the Friends Cemetery. All right. Also on the back table, if you didn't get it, um, there are excerpts from Abby Mendenhall, Abby Swift Mendenhall's diary. Um, and we talk about her at the end of the program. And then there's also a handout um, concerning Henry Wheeler's conscient well, it wasn't a conscientious objection, it wasn't called that then, but he petitioned um, to be exempt from service in the Civil War. And it's just a very interesting retelling of how he went about that and who convened for him on his behalf. And eventually President Lincoln did pardon him from service and paroled him and he got to come back to the village. He did other things to serve his country, but he did not have to go in combat. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So those are the three handouts in the back. If you didn't get them coming in, make sure you pick them up on the way out. Okay. And then June Atwood also is in the audience here with her family. And she gave me uh, a pamphlet that I had never seen before that has become a vital part of the archives. I appreciate that. And David, yes? Uh, you have, on both these slides so far, uh, promised that there will be a, a walk uphill with the ancient cemetery inside the first meeting house tomorrow morning when it's scheduled to rain. <laughs> Let's do that on Friday morning at 9 o'clock. <coughs> Friday morning meeting in the library parking lot. Okay. All right, everybody have that? Let's switch that to Friday, and I'll put it on the sign out there too, David. I'll do that tomorrow right away when I get in. Okay, so Friday morning at 9, and if you've never walked up there before, like I say on the slide, it's about a 10-minute walk, and once you get up the first hill, it's golden. All right? All right, so tonight, we don't have time to talk about every swift. We are taking a look at two different lineages, both of which had tremendous impact on the village as it is today. And historically, their legacies um, from the descendants of these two Swifts, Swift families, um, really did define the village and continues to define it. So we have what I'm referring to as the village Swifts. Abiel. This is his family. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Abiel, his cousin Paul, Abiel's son Moses, and then Silas F. Swift. And then in the latter part of the presentation, we'll be talking about our summer Swifts, which were Dee Wheeler, Henry, Abby, Swift, Mendenhall. They all love the village even though they only spent summers here. Although I found out today that uh, Henry did come down and spend a few winters here as well. I found that out yesterday. So Abiel and Paul, cousins. They started in Sandwich. Abiel came to West Falmouth to apprentice. His sons Daniel and Seth worked in the blacksmith shop. Paul, the cousin, came to the village looking to farm. 
We found a chance to buy land in the land. Two Bowermans left, sold their inheritance, and moved to New York State. Paul and Moses purchased Seth's farm and the village windmill. And I find this fascinating that in 1854, Moses, who wasn't busy enough running the windmill, decided at age 68 he would organize the union store as a co-op. And so that's what he did. I know this is a little difficult to read, but this is a, a document. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written. But if you skip to about the middle of it, and I'll read it aloud for you, because this kind of gives you an idea of what the blacksmith shop uh, meant to everybody in the village. The store was a geography and human nature school. And Daniel and Seth Swift's blacksmith shop was, as it were, the only theological school that I ever attended. It was very impressive to us boys as we reverently sat or stood with open mouths to hear the deep conversation of neighbors <coughs> by the anvil on the solemn problems of scripture and life. And it was a meeting place for the entire village. Here's a historic view of the blacksmith shop in 1897. You can see that it's standing alone. It's on Blacksmith Shop Road. It's still there. It's behind the C.H. Newton building, just beyond the fire station. And it's still there for a number of reasons. I think people have taken some care to protect it as it's been developed around it. Also, it was built solidly with pink granite. So it isn't going to go anywhere fast. And the reason for that, of course, was it was a blacksmith shop. And so from the blacksmith shop, a deal to Moses, to, to Silas. So we start our story with Silas F. Swift, okay, son of Moses. And this is the obituary. I'll let you, you've got, we've had time to read it. I think it's, and what I've done is I've highlighted some of his accomplishments. So let me give you a minute. I don't have to read this to you, and then I'll ask if there's any questions. Oh, the Silas F. Homestead. Um, the, the Moses. 
Yeah, one of the pictures up there has the address and has the information. As you came in, the photographs there, there's a picture of the, um, the Wheeler homestead and then the, the, the Paul homestead. But I don't have the Moses and Silas. Okay. And as I understand it, and this has been reported to me from a number of people, is that basically in the village when it was young, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, is if you were a child, you basically grew up in any number of homes. So, I, you know, having a homestead was fine, but you weren't necessarily tied to that homestead. You know, that expression, it took a village, was really in place here in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So this was his advertisement in the Falmouth Directory of 1900. It was located on Spring Cove. I don't know if you're familiar with the West Falmouth area, but if you come on up, up towards the market and you take a left on Dock Road, and a right on Nashawina. It was located on a trajectory there. Is that right, Bill? Uh, yeah, sort of. Sort of? Well, <laughs> correct the record then, please. Where was it located? Well, just up the street here, we have the old people on the land. Yes. If you walk there, you almost to the bike path now, there is a railroad. Yeah. And in that area somewhere, we are not able to find a foundation or any type of Was it was it between the railroad and the harbor? Or no, this I, side of the railroad? Well, I think I heard that it was moving it was moved at some point. And, and the location I'm deciding right now is so it is the final oh. point. So there are a lot of tributes to the windmill. It was very well loved in the village of West Falmouth. And there's a picture, and milk, I don't see water there, so unless we're taking it from the water. And then here's another picture of the windmill. Notice the horse and buggies. If you look at the old issues of the Falmouth Enterprise, we had a number of poets or people who thought they were poets <laughs> in Falmouth and in West Falmouth during the 17 and 1800s. And probably still into the 1900s. Okay, in addition to all of the jobs that Silas held, he also was a landowner. And I know there are people here that are either vacationing in or living in one of the houses that um, he didn't build. Um, Fred Bowman, also from West Falmouth, built over 100 houses on the vineyard and here. He was the builder of the two mansions across the street, or the two summer homes. I don't like to refer to them as mansions. The two summer homes across the street, and also the builder of the library. at all, just wave at me. I'll do my best to, to answer it, otherwise I'll write it down and I'll look it up later. So there was no date on this picture. My guess is it's about 1920. Most of the lots were sold and being developed by the early 1900s.
And this is from Between the Forest and the Bay, which if you don't know that book, is probably the best history of West Falmouth that we have. The book is available on Amazon. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised that the houses built in 1908 have survived so well when we have the Bowerman House that was built in the 1680s and is still standing. Now it said in the last slide that maybe Silas had been um, motivated to develop the lots because Ellery Channing Wright was developing land north of the harbor. Um, I'm not sure if it was his choice of design or if it was Fred Bowen's, but it's interesting to me that the Methodist camps and the houses over there on the vineyard were built about the same time that Silas was building his houses here. So I'm going to guess that some of the features in the houses on the Swift lots might have been influenced by what was going on on the vineyard in terms of building. And this is the Kingman Estate. I don't think it's still owned by the Kingman family. Am I right or incorrect on that? Anyone know? I'm right, okay. It's a beautiful property. And you can see most of it from Nashua if you dare drive slow. <laughs> and this is a postcard that is in our collection of Spring Cove. Yes, Spring Cove is, um, I just call everything over there West Falmouth Harbor. But where you put your kayak in, I believe that section is Spring Cove. If you go up around the corner to where the bridge is, that is Mill Cove. I think I'm correct on that. I, I've, I've taken a look at a lot of atlases and back and forth, but it's all a part of West Falmouth Harbor. Yeah. And Silas on right down to the harbor front. I know. Interesting. <laughs> All right, we are moving on to our second family. And we're starting, we could have started earlier. Daniel, you know, was a blacksmith and a shipbuilder. And he bought the, um, the blacksmith shop from Richard Landers. So their father was a very talented shipbuilder. All right, and talent runs deep in this family. The more I look, the more I discover. Um, besides also being talented, they have been very generous in their support of the library, the meeting house, other organizations in this area. And not only that, but wherever they've lived, they've left a legacy, you know, for, for future residents of their cities or villages or towns. And David, I'm not sure that I say second meeting house or third. I said third, but second meeting house. I'm not sure that's correct. Uh, actually, they funded uh, uh, the uh, uh, renovation of the third meeting house in the 1890s. Okay, thank you. All right. Henry Swift was the older brother of Henry and Daniel. And once again, this is the obituary from the Falmouth um, Enterprise. He 
He and his brother were famous for many things. They have a number of inventions that are patented. They are probably most famous for their design of an envelope folding machine that eventually became the Worcester Envelope Company. They had the window in. Oh, the window in the. They had to do straight out of the sentence, right? All right. The reason their envelope folding machine was so useful was they put the clear window in it. And not only that, other people had tried to design something that um, would work without problems. And they just couldn't do it. And so they would bring Henry and or Daniel in, and they would write the ship, make the changes, and then produce. They had the mechanical know-how to build almost anything. But I just love the language and how this is written. And Henry, the older brother, did spend some winters here. Both he and Daniel, B. Wheeler, loved the time they spent here. They, their main homes were in Worcester. But there's no bias here at all. <laughs> as comfortable as if he was at his Worcester home. Mm-hmm. 
would have been in the 1900s. So yeah, it's a good spot. Okay, so this is the first one. This is a little bit of duplication. I'll have to fix that when I do the um, revisions. But this is the story.
Yes. I have a copy of it. I'm not sure how it got shifted in the slides, but I'll show that to you a little bit later. His handwritten letter asking for the reprieve and then the signed parole that he got back. So this continues his legacy as an inventor. And this just talks about who he associated with as he um, pursued that perfect envelope with the clear window in it. But I love it once again about halfway down the paragraph. They are recruiting Henry to come on board to assist in this new endeavor. And what does Henry do? He sends for the little brother. Who just happened to be unemployed? I don't know why that's in this obituary, but it's just one more thing. What would that be the population, the around population of the sun in the mid 1800s? And then the sun as That's it. You know, I've only, I've only seen one reference to that, and it, does, it didn't quite inflate to the percentage that it does now with summer residents. Um, I, let's see, who did I call on? I mean, growing up here in Joanville, how big was the village? Was it 1,000 people? Now it's only 3,000 something. Do you have any idea? No. How did it On the east side of the community, how did all the developments you have now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of the development in the village and all the way along towards North Falmouth didn't really begin until the late 40s, early 50s. David? Um, the, it seems to be the case that summer visitors only really started coming after the railroad came through the Yes, yes. And the summer, the, the selling of parcels for summer homes escalated with Chappaquoit, when it was Hot Island was what? Chappaquoit Island. Um, and that began, then, then residents own land realized, oh, there's value here besides farming. And that was in the late 1800s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have a map date in 1853, which shows uh, actually the entire case, but shows every resident, well, the every resident uh, from every household at that time. And I think there probably are only about 24 households, right? Do you remember Daniel? Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 It's like I put it like 50 or 60 individual little plots. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this is in the mid 1800s. 1853. Okay, thank you. Okay. And this is Mr. Daniel Wheeler, the namesake of Lee Wheeler that we're talking about today. And he's here all the way from Fairbanks, Alaska. Thank you for coming. And then I love the tribute at the very end to Henry. His whole life was one of persistent righteousness, and his decease will be regretted most by those who knew him best. Here's the request in his own handwriting, citing his birthright as a member of the Society of Friends to be excused from combat. <clears throat> and that's very difficult to read. This entire presentation will be posted on the library website, and you'll be able to take another look at it. Okay. And that's the parole, or the, the reprieve.
And this is the paper that's on the back that gives you the full uh, accounting of what he faced when he tried to be excused from active service. All right, behind every good, good man is a good woman. And this was Emma, Henry's wife, Emma. And um, just a little bit about her. They keep referring that she was always in frail health, yet she outlived Henry by three years. Um, she loved her time here, back and forth between Worcester and West Falmouth. And once again, as many of the wives did, besides raising children, they did missionary work and somehow took care of those less fortunate than they were. All right, so this is Daniel Swift and his wife, second wife and the mother of his children. So we are now talking about this family. And there's the family homestead. And now it's located down across from the post office, I get. The, the homestead was moved. That's just a fun picture. Okay. And then this is Dee who, um, it's funny, the, the brothers were, were very close, um, and they lived close to each other in, in Worcester, they lived close to each other here, they both worked for the same companies and the same people, they had very different roles in those companies, but, um, you know, they spent a lifetime together, obviously, um, pursuing their love of mechanics, science, invention. And I did mention that Henry had a, um, he actually had a, a microscope, not even a telescope, and had an observatory set up in his garage behind the house across the street. And he would bring people in and he actually had the uh, telescope that he invented he could see all the solar bodies, and uh, the telescope now is on display at William Penn College. All right, he donated there, and I think it's probably still working, knowing Henry. Okay, back to Daniel. Okay. And this is a little bit, three piece kind of what we already know about Henry, because he was right there too. Here is a picture of that we are watching, we talked about. Initially, it was called the Eureka Close Squeezer. And I guess he decided that was not the best thing. <laughs> and this is just the history of the envelope company and how it went back and forth between ownership. But Logan Swift and Brigham, and then they sold to um, the U.S. Envelope Company in Worcester. In, 19, in 1898. No, I have that wrong. He worked for the U.S. Envelope Company in 1898, and then it was sold to the Worcester Envelope Company. Here's a picture of a machine. Not the machine that they invented, but a similar one. And then they also invented a elevator guard all right, that would prevent you from tripping as you entered and exited an elevator. And then their sister, not to be outdone, ran her own business in Falmouth. And this is a copy of the ledger from her business. And I can't tell from it what exactly she was selling. It's a lot of names and a lot of um, either money or quantities. Erica, do you know what the business was? Um, she sold a bunch of different things. She sold cloth and thread and rope and you know, many, many different things. I mean, if you blow it up, the variety of the matter is the only thing. Yeah. Okay, great. And 
and this was just um, Susan having to catch this in the files, uh, paid three cents. The letter sent to Daniel Swift. And what it's spelled with. Swift reunion. Sarah Jane Gifford Swift. I looked all over for a photograph, and I finally found it at the Feldman Historical Society. So not a lot of pictures exist of, Dan, uh, of Daniel's wife. And she, like the other Swifts, was very involved. You know what amazes me about the people living in the village? in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, they all lived long. 88 years, 90 years, um, Sarah's mother lived to be over 100. That's if they made it past the uh, yeah, that, that's That is true. Yeah. Yeah. And she, Sarah, was a missionary here and abroad. She traveled everywhere as a member of the Society of Friends, but she was also involved in so many things. And once again at the very end, it's a beautiful tribute. Yeah, she went to Syria and Jamaica in the 1800s. Well, one of their sons was a missionary in Jamaica. Which son was that? Uh, I, didn't I didn't think they had children. Yes, Dan. Okay. Okay. Oh, as you tour the cemetery, you'll be able to see that. Okay. And then this is just a nice tribute, but we're running a little, a little short on time. This is the pamphlet that Joan gave me, or June gave me, and it just these are pictures and views of the Emerson House that I had never seen before. I'm not sure where they came from, and it gives you a little bit more history about the brothers. And then now we are to our third Swift family we're celebrating, Abby Swift Mendenhall. Her father was Sea Captain Silas Swift, not to be confused with Silas F. And she donated the land for the library. She also, and, and you can't, oh, I guess you can read this, but I like where it says down at the bottom that the land she donated is for library or literary purposes only. This provision has more than once served to prevent its use as a dancing hall. So no dancing in here today. When you come back to the reception, there will not be dancing. All right. Um, she met her husband, in, I don't know, if in North Carolina or where they met. They moved to Minneapolis. She was one of four women, women who ran the Bethany home, and I have a note here, I think I'll remember it, the four women. One was a Methodist, one was an Adventist, one was, um, oh, what was the other one? But they came from four different religion, religious backgrounds, and they opened a Bethany home for um, girls who were pregnant um, through no fault of their own, according to the four women. Um, so this ran in the Minneapolis Sunday Tribune in 1921. It was a historical article about the Bethany home, all right, in Minneapolis. And these uh, links you can access once it goes online. But um, this is just beautifully written about what these four women did, what they believed in. They felt every fallen woman should have a second chance. The girls in the home had their children there. They were allowed to keep them, but they were supported if they chose that. And in some cases, they'd find him a good husband in the country because they knew they'd have better luck being an unwed, or now a newly wed mother with a child in the country. But the Bethany home really served 
a population, and we're talking about Minneapolis in the 1800s, that was wild and rugged, and there was prostitution. And so these women wanted not only to give these girls a safe place, but they also wanted to curb the number of girls that were being forced into prostitution. And you'll be able to read all of this. It really is quite fascinating. And then one thing Charlotte and Abby did is they passed laws that said anybody running uh, a brothel or so would be fined. And so they petitioned the government of Minneapolis to give them all the fine money. And the government agreed. And so this is, a, the, this is Dee Wheeler's house, as it looked. And it's inserted here because I am going to bring you full circle now and then close the presentation. What do they do over there? They help mothers, preg pregnant mothers. They give them the same services that Abby Swift Mendenhall was giving those children, those young women, in the 1800s. And so it's almost as if it was a destiny that it would all come together this way. And there are ex excerpts from Abby Swift Mendenhall's diary on the back, that fascinating reading. And then, before we leave, uh, we have a mystery concerning Benjamin Swift's. And I've tongue-in-cheek this with my friend David over there. We, meaning David Young, want us to solve this mystery this evening. And he wants your input. He's done a tremendous amount of work. He has a genealogy of Benjamin Swift that runs 20-some pages. How? 20 pages. And it goes through all the families. And this one question remains. So um, what we're going to do here at this juncture is we're going to encourage you to go next door to tour the meeting house if you've never had a chance to do that. Or you can stay here and I'll turn the fans on. Oh, 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 oh no one will come in. Oh, well, we can have it on because of the audio. I'll turn the fans on and it'll get comfortable in here and you can stay and visit. And then at 8 o'clock, I have a nice uh, array of sandwiches, vegetables, fruits, desserts that I will be putting out on the table. So once you're done with the tour, come back. By that time, I will have everything set up. If there is a question or if you are confused about anything I might have said, please drop me a note, leave it on the library desk or give it to me during the reception. But I thank you all for coming and I thank the Swift family for all they've done for the village of West Velma. Thank you. I don't get to go. Thank you. <laughs>